Hello. Um, we'll give people a couple more minutes to sign on. It looks like some people are still signing into the webinar. Um, my name is Kelly Hayes. I'm from the Trust and Estates Department here at McAndrews, Mahalik, Conley, Hulse, and Ryan. And we are going to shortly start discussing an overview of the estate administration process. Maybe at like 12.05. Um, I will point out that there is a Q&A button probably on your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can just type them in there. I can't make any promises that I will see them while I am talking, but I will leave some time at the end to try to answer any questions that you may have. Um, if you think of questions later, oh, someone are doing it. Um, will the recording be available to the participants? Um, Mark, I believe that it's going to be posted to our YouTube channel, um, but I'll confirm that with our marketing director. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, if you have any questions that you think of later, you can always go to our website, McAndrews Law Offices or lawoffice.com. There is a contact us and you can submit the question um, that way. Uh, so an overview of the estate administration process. Maybe you um, are wondering what will what will your loved ones have to, to have to do after you pass, or maybe you're thinking what will I have to do uh, when one of my loved ones pass. So we're just going to provide you with a brief overview of kind of what happens in that estate administration process. Before we jump right into that, I will take this time to give a little reminder that if you are acting as someone's power of attorney. Um, your power ends at the death of the principal. So you cannot act for someone with the power of attorney after they have passed away. Um, once someone's passed away, the will after the executor or administrator uh, gets sworn in, um, that's what's governing the process from that point forward. Um, one other quick little thing, if you remember nothing else from this presentation, use this time to go and double check your beneficiary designations. So if you have a life insurance policy, make sure you have both primary and contingent beneficiaries named. If you have a retirement account, so an IRA, 401k, Roth, uh, 403b, any of those retirement type accounts, take this opportunity now to double check it. Make sure you have a primary beneficiary named and a contingent beneficiary named. Um, you will uh, allow your beneficiaries more options if they are designated beneficiaries at your death. Um, so with that being said, here is an overview of the estate administration process. We're gonna start with some important terms. So what are some important terms when we are talking about estate administration? Um, two words that you'll hear often are testate versus intestate. Um, a testate estate administration is when someone died with a will. An intestate administration would be when someone dies without a will. How do you have a valid will in Pennsylvania? So Pennsylvania does recognize holographic wills. So that's just a handwritten will. Um, but a valid will has to be um, written by someone who's over 18 years of age. So if you are a minor child, you can't make a will for yourself. It has to be in writing and it has to be signed by the testator. So the person who was right with whose will it is at the end. Um, like I said, intestate is where the decedent did not execute a last will and testament. So I always say, if you don't have a will, Pennsylvania writes one for you. Um, we have intestacy statutes in Pennsylvania and they determine who your heirs at law are. You may or may not like the will that Pennsylvania writes for you. Um, so you do have an opportunity at any point during your lifetime, as long as you have capacity to create your own will. Um, a lot of people create wills, not just because they don't necessarily like the way that Pennsylvania would write a will for them, but they may have trusts or um, other things that they want to include in their wills. They want to maybe want to direct specific property to specific people. Um, you may have a family member with a qualifying disability that you want to make sure can inherit from you, but then that also doesn't lose their resource-dependent benefits at your death. So there are just some reasons you may have that last will and testament, or you should have a last will and testament. 
Um, so we talked about intestate versus testate. So you had a will or you don't have a will. And now we're going to talk about your assets. So we have what are called probate assets and non-probate assets. So probate assets are assets that pass to the beneficiaries that are either identified in your will, or like I said, if you don't have a will, as determined by the laws of intestacy. So these are assets that are in your name alone, that don't have a beneficiary designation or do not have a joint owner. So typically they are checking accounts, savings accounts, real property that's owned individually or as tenants in common. So each owner owns their individual share and there isn't a right of survivorship where the property passes automatically at death. Cars, personal property, all of those things are considered probate assets. I often say that when we're doing um, wills for married couples, unless we're doing some more sophisticated tax planning, what we're really doing is we're planning for what happens when both spouses are gone. Um, so at that point, like when the first spouse passes, all of the assets essentially become in the sole name of the surviving spouse. So they would all be considered probate assets to the extent they're not beneficiary designated. Non-probate assets. So non-probate assets are assets that are going to pass to beneficiaries um, that are named in a properly executed beneficiary designation form. So those forms are usually with the financial organizations uh, that manage whichever type of account we're talking about. So whether it be like the MetLife, the life insurance company, or um, whoever is managing a retirement account, so Vanguard or Fidelity, one of those. Um, real property, so if it's owned by tenants by the entirety, so that is typically property that's owned by a married couple. If you were married when you purchased your house, your house is likely held as tenants by the entireties, which is essentially joint tenants with right of survivorship, but with a little bit of extra protection. Um, or if, if you just own it as joint tenants with right of survivorship. Again, the property is passing by operation of law to the surviving joint owner, so it's a non-probate asset. I don't need the probate asset, probate process to transfer the asset to the beneficiaries. Same thing, IRAs, 401ks, essentially any type of retirement plan here. Um, if you have a beneficiary designated, it passes to the beneficiary. Um, and that would be a non-probate asset. I will tell you that some financial organizations, and this is in no way me telling you not to make sure that you have your beneficiaries designated, um, but some plans have kind of a priority of people. So if there is no beneficiary, they look for a spouse or um, no spouse that looks for children. Not all financial institutions have that. And I will tell you, sometimes um, it's not what you want to happen anyway. So the best course of action is to name those beneficiaries. Life insurance, jointly owned bank accounts. They're all just a few examples of non-probate assets. Um, why is the distinction between probate and non-probate important? One, because the probate process, one where you go to the register of wills in the county where the person passed, and we'll get to that, uh, is based, you need an estimate of all of the probate assets. So when you're estimating for the register of wills, the value of the assets, you are only estimating probate assets. You are not estimating non-probate assets. So the register of wills will charge a fee based on the gross probate assets. So you don't wanna add the IRA if it has a beneficiary on it or life insurance if it has a beneficiary on it or a joint account to that calculation. That's not saying that those non-probate assets aren't subject to Pennsylvania inheritance tax because they are, um, unless we're talking about life insurance, which is the only um, exception. Um, so we talked about the probate and the non-probate. So now you are ready to go to the register of wills and get officially appointed as either the executor or the administrator of the estate. That's what we call you're receiving the grant of letters. That's official your official order that you are um, the executor or the administrator of the estate. You'll be issued short certificates, and that's what's going to allow you to move assets into the name of the estate and then eventually get them to the beneficiaries. Um, how do you get that grant of letters? So it involves going to the local register of wills in the county where the decedent resided. Um, you will need to oftentimes make an appointment first. 
Um, some counties do this virtually, some require in-person meetings, some give you the option, but essentially you need all of the same things when you go there. You need the original, so not a copy of the death certificate, well, I guess it technically is a copy. You need like that green colored death certificate. You need, if there is a will, you need the original last will and testament. So that's why we always tell you to keep your wills in a safe place, which is not a safe deposit box. Um, a renunciation, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later if they're applicable. So that would be more in the case of if your executor didn't want to serve, or if we're talking about an administrator and we have to see who's going to serve if there were several people who would have been able to fill that role. Identification, so your executor or your administer, administrator, all kind of considered personal representatives. We need the identification of the personal representative. An estimate of the value of the assets, again, that just comprise the probate estate, and then some sort of way to pay the probate fees. So like I said, there'll be probate fees based on the assets of the estate, probate estate. Um, the wills probated in the county where the decedent had his or her last residence. Um, if you are bringing the will, the will is typically witnessed. It, it's witnessed, so it has, or it has to be attested by two witnesses, or the will must be self-proving. Um, self-proving just means that when you did your will, you have the witnesses kind of certifying that they saw you sign it. You were over eighteen. You weren't under any undue influence. Um, Allie, am I still talking? Okay. It just told me it signed me out. Um, okay. Um, so to be self-proving, I'm sorry, I got that kicked out. Uh, to be self-proving, uh, the will needs to be signed by two witnesses who are asserting that you're over 18, you're not under any undue influence, you're signing this will kind of of your own free will. Um, and then they sign and then that's notarized. If you have that self-proving affidavit, you don't need to produce witnesses at probate. I would say that most wills that uh, people go to attorneys for are self-proving at this point. Um, if there is a will, so again, we're using our terms, it's a testate estate, you are appointed as the executor of that estate and you will get what are called letters testamentary. Um, if you decide, even if you're named in the will, you can decide that you may not want to serve, you might not be able to serve as an executor at that given time, you can renounce. So by renouncing, all you're saying is, I can't do this right now, I can't administer the estate. So if there's a successor listed, it'll move to the successor. The renunciation is just a one page sheet of paper that says that you would sign and have notarized and it would be submitted to the register of wills. Um, in most wills, we waive any type of bond requirement. Um, so usually if we're dealing with a testate estate, um, you have an executor and there's no bond requirement. Um, an intestate estate, so again, our terms, intestate estate means there was no will. Um, the person who's gonna be appointed, say, they have the same roles, the executor and the administrator, they just have a different title. So if you are, I guess the, personal representative is kind of the general term, and then we'll break it down. So administrator, no will, executor, we have a will. Um, so how do we determine if there's no will, who the administrator will be? The statute tells us who is kind of, they list an order of priority and who should serve in that role. So um, usually it's, well, those entitled to the residuary estate. So who the main beneficiary of, oh, those entitled to the residue. Well, it, in this case, there would be no will. So it's the surviving spouse is technically first. If there's a surviving spouse, that's who we're going to look to to administer the estate. If there's no surviving spouse, we're going to look to adult children. Um, if you have adult children who are over 18, any of those children have an equal opportunity or an equal right, I would say, to serve. So if you had four children, any of them could serve as the administrator. Um, the other individuals who are entitled, you kind of keep going in that order of priority. So then after children, we continue down the intestate line. So then I would look to parents, I would then look to siblings, and it keeps going out. A principal creditor of the decedent um, at the time of his death can force the uh, opening of an estate if no one else is going to do it. 
um, or your kind of catch all at the end is like anyone else who may need to administer it if you don't have any of these other family members. Um, so like I was saying, if one person in the class wishes to serve, all the other members of the class must renounce. So that's with your children example. So we have an example here. Mary dies in test state, so she dies without a will. She has six children. Um, all six children, so all the siblings agree that the oldest child, this happens that way, um, is going to serve as the administrator. So how will John be able to serve as the administrator? He needs to get all five of his siblings to execute a renunciation in favor of him. By executing the renunciation, none of those other children are giving up any right to the um, estate. All they are doing is saying, essentially, we don't want to do the paperwork. We're going to make John do it because he is the oldest and that's what we're going to have him do. Um, with an intestate administration, there could be a bond requirement. In Pennsylvania, we don't require uh, bonds for many things unless you live out of state. So if you are not from Pennsylvania, we don't trust you very much here. So we're going to make you post a bond in order to serve as an administrator. Um, oftentimes, too, if there are minor children who would be intestate beneficiaries, that would also necessitate the need for a bond. Um, is there a way to handle an estate without going through probate? Um, yes. So you can do a small estate petition. I will say that oftentimes it ends up being more work than it's worth. Um, and you also, like your estate can't be worth more than $50,000. You still need to pay all of the, pay debts, file an inheritance tax return. You typically can't file the small estate petition until you get the appraisement back from the Department of Revenue. So it typically does take longer. And in my experience, most financial institutions or places are looking for that short certificate that you receive um, when you probate. And even if you have a court order, and I fight with some financial institutions with my court order that says you have to release these funds, um, they're still looking for, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. They want to probate, they want a short certificate. That's what they're looking for. They're not going to do anything without it. Um, there is a way, there's a, under the statute uh, 20, uh, Pennsylvania Consolidated Statute 3101, if you have a depository account, so like checking, savings, something like that, and it's under $10,000, um, you can usually, if you are a spouse or if you are a child, you can usually go to the bank um, and request those funds from the bank. Again, it has to be under $10,000, and you typically have to show proof that the, in, um, not inheritance tax, the funeral bill has been paid. And then the bank should release those funds to you. So, I mean, if it's something, if it's an account that that's small, that shouldn't in itself necessitate probate. Those assets would still be subject to inheritance tax, which we'll also get to later. Um, other ways that your estate may not be subject to probate, if you had all of your assets in a revocable trust, um, a revocable trust is considered, anything in the revocable trust is considered non-probate property. Um, if the Property is not titled in the revocable trust, it's probate property. Um, most people, when they do a revocable trust, have what we call a pour over will. So it's saying basically anything, any asset that I may have missed, I have to probate for, but then I want my trust document to control. So we pour it over into um, the revocable trust, those assets that were not actually titled into the trust. Um, the revocable trust does not avoid any estate or inheritance taxes. All a revocable trust is avoiding is probate. And in Pennsylvania, probate really isn't that difficult. Um, and again, in my experience, oftentimes when you have a revocable trust, and there are some reasons to have revocable trusts, for example, if you have out-of-state property, things like that, and you want to avoid what we would call an ancillary probate, so a second probate in the um, state where the out of state real estate's located, a revocable trust is kind of a good vehicle to include in your estate plan at that point. Um, but if you have, if you're in Pennsylvania and you have all Pennsylvania property um, and you just really want a revocable trust and you can certainly do it, but the concern is that you won't end up retitling all of your assets to the revocable trust. And then you're gonna have to administer a trust and probate the estate anyway. Um, 
how do we determine beneficiaries? So, I mean, it's pretty easy to determine the beneficiaries if the decedent had a will, right? So we just go by who the people that are listed in the will to who receives um, whatever shares of the estate. Um, when you have beneficiaries of a will or when you have the heirs of the estate, the beneficiaries and the heirs are what I would uh, what, what I would typically say, like you are receiving the distributable estate. So after all of the debts, taxes and everything paid, you get down to like a net number and that's what then gets distributed. Um, if mom or dad had $100,000, we're just not splitting the $100,000. There's any expenses um, that my, and debts that mom or dad may have had, um, their inheritance taxes, income taxes, anything like that comes out first. If you don't have a will, um, like I said, Pennsylvania writes one for you. Um, the statutes here on the screen, 20 Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes. So it's a few sections, 2102 through 2104. They kind of, those statutes tell us who's going to inherit if we don't have a will. So there's your surviving spouse. Typically, we're looking for the closest living relatives if you don't have a will like under the statute. So who's going to receive a share of this state? So if you are survived by a surviving spouse and you don't have any children or living parents, so no living children, no living parents, your surviving spouse receives everything. If you have a surviving spouse and children who are the children of both you and the surviving spouse, the surviving spouse gets the first 30,000 plus half of the balance and the other balance would go to your children. If you are survived, you don't have any children, but you're survived by parents, um, the surviving spouse would receive again the first 30% or 30%, 30,000 plus half of the remaining balance of the estate, and the other half would go to your parents. If you have children um, and at least one of your children is not the child of your surviving spouse, then the estate is just split 50 50. So you can see kind of in just talking about like the surviving, the share of the surviving spouse, this is my, this may not be what you want to happen if something passed away. Like how would you want everything to go to your spouse? Would you want your children included right then? Would you want your parents included over your surviving spouse? So that's why a will, again, allows you to do what you would prefer. If you don't have a surviving spouse, we look to children. So do you have any children? I will say something to remember. So if you had four children um, and two of them had predeceased you, the your estate would be divided into two of them predeceased you, I should say, and they have children. So your estate would be divided into four shares. 25% um, would go to child A who's surviving, 25% would go to child B who's surviving. 25% would go to the, be divided between the children of child C and 25% would be divided between the children of child D. If, for example, child D didn't have any children, then your estate's just being divided three ways. Um, so child A would get his, well, one third, child B would get his one third, and then the children of the deceased child um, child C would get a third. And then because child D has no children, kind of that line ended. Um, if you don't have children, it goes to parents, no parents, siblings, or their issue. So again, you have that same if a sibling predeceases, their children to step up into their share um, and take that. Grandparents, aunts, uncles. Um, and then people are always worried that their estate's going to go to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So the state's going to take everything. Um, there's a lot of people that we have, you have to have no essentially living blood relative anywhere before the state of Pennsylvania comes into play. What happens if I have a will, but I am getting divorced or I am already divorced and I didn't change my will? Um, any provision in a will for a spouse is void if the decedent dies after obtaining a divorce from the spouse or if you're in the middle of the divorce proceedings after the grounds have been established, but no divorce decree has been entered, unless the will indicates that the provisions for the spouse are intended to survive the divorce. Um, something else interesting to note is that a spouse who for one year or more prior to the death of the other spouse has willfully neglected or refused to perform the duty to support the other spouse or is maliciously deserted, the 
surviving spouse, again, for more than a year, they don't have a right or interest to the real or personal property of the other spouse. And that's statutory. So, but again, but that's just applying to the probate estate. We have had issues recently where um, spouses have been estranged for decades, live in other states. But again, when you're dealing with that non-probate property, um, like I had mentioned before, the financial institution may have kind of a well, they do all of their, they have plan documents and the plan may kind of indicate if there's no beneficiary, I'm looking for the surviving spouse. If you've been estranged from your surviving, from your spouse for that long, I doubt that that's the person that you want to inherit that asset. So that complicates things. So again, beneficiary is very important. Um, also, if you're estranged for that long, I would maybe consider finalizing that divorce. Um, an elective share. What if I'm married and I wrote a will and I wrote my husband out of it? So I just said, I'm um, leaving everything to my children. My husband gets nothing. Um, if I don't have a prenuptial agreement or anything that allows me to do that, or even maybe some sort of postnuptial agreement, um, the surviving spouse has the right to claim an elective share. So the elective share is the right to get up to one third of the decedent's property. So you, you really can't write out your spouse. Um, we have a right to get what well, spouse has a right to get one third of the property. The surviving spouse has to claim the elective share in writing with the orphans court within six months of the date of death or the appointment of the personal representative. So your executor, I would imagine it's the executor if I wrote everyone out, um, whichever is later. There's certain property that's not going to be subject to the election of the uh, elective share. So that's any property that's can conveyed with like the consent of the surviving spouse, life insurance. Um, so if the spouse wasn't the beneficiary, I'm always going to go by the beneficiary designation, interest in any in employer established pension, profit sharing, stock, deferred compensation, disability, death benefit, or other such plan, and property passing under a power of appointment that the decedent exercised or failed to exercise. Um, Sometimes you see, if you are the beneficiary of a trust, sometimes you have the ability to appoint who would receive the trust proceeds after you pass away. If you exercise that power of appointment, like in a will, in, in your own will. Um, so that's kind of, if you're wondering what power of appointment is, where you would see that. Disclaimers. A beneficiary can also choose, maybe they don't want to inherit um, from the estate. Maybe that's going to cause them some issues they don't want to. You can say, I disclaim if you are going to inherit either under the will or via the intestacy statutes. And then if you properly disclaim, um, the disclaimer has to be filed um, with the orphans court. Um, but if you properly disclaim, you are treated as if you predeceased the decedent. So you can't necessarily disclaim in favor of someone. Um, but if I, so if I passed away, or yeah, if I passed away and my husband was the beneficiary of my estate and he disclaimed, it would go to our children. Um, or if so, if you disclaimed it, you know, it, it essentially goes to the next in the intestate line. Um, or if the will gives an alternative provision. So it says, if Kelly predeceased me, then it goes, the disclaimer would kind of follow the same suit. Um, so now we've talked about the different beneficiaries. You've gone to the register of wills. You've gotten yourself sworn in. You have your short certificates and or your letters of administration or your letters testamentary. And you're like, now what do I do? Um, so the first main job of the personal representative is to kind of marshal the assets. So you want to kind of, you want to collect everything. You want to get as much information as you can. You want to know what are all these assets? What are all these debts? Um, and kind of start start there. Um, once you start finding the assets, you want to usually, so if there was a checking account, you're gonna to go to the bank with your short certificate um, and your death certificate, and you're gonna close the account and then you're gonna open a new estate account and you're gonna start moving all of the assets over there. So the probate assets, um, those non-probate assets will transfer by the beneficiary designation. Usually once someone um, alerts the financial institution of the death. So usually you have to provide the death certificate and then the financial institution will send the necessary paperwork to who the named beneficiaries were. Um, 
what's like your next step as a personal representative, you have some administrative tasks to do. The first of which would be to uh, provide written notice of the opening of the estate and the appointment of the personal representative um, within three months of the appointment. So you have to, and then after you send that notice to all of the beneficiaries named in the will, plus any of the decedent's children, so just in case the child wasn't named in the will or was written out of the will, um, children, all children and everyone named in the will have to be named or have to be noticed. And then if you have no will, it is the intestate heirs. So if the intestate heirs who are going to be received, you don't have to go all the way down the line, but if the ch all the children are going to be the people who are receiving uh, or the heirs that are going to receive the estate, they all have to get the notice of beneficiary. Once you've sent this notice, um, you have to file another certification with the Register of Wills, letting them know that you actually did um, fulfill your obligation and send the notices that are required. So for, again, test data states, all beneficiaries named under the will, um, surviving spouse and uh, spouse, spouse and children. So if they weren't named in the will, intestate estate, all intestate beneficiaries. I would say intestate beneficiaries who are receiving a share of the estate. Um, and then there's some additional information about who would be a minor beneficiary, parent or legal guardian. If you have someone who's been adjudicated and incapacitated, you'd serve that notice or mail that notice to the legal guardian. If you your um, will makes any type of charitable request, so you are making gifts to charity, and I would say gifts to charity that are coming out of the, the estate, not gifts to charity that says if all my other beneficiaries have predeceased me, then everything goes to charity. So the charities are actually receiving something. So if the charities are actually receiving something at your death and the bequest is in excess of $25,000, you're required to send a notice of beneficial interest to the attorney general's office. Um, another housekeeping item that you have to take in the beginning of the estate administration process is if your decedent was over 55 years old and they were um, receiving medical assistance, I typically send the request for a statement of claim to the Department of Human Services. Um, in any case, just so I have the letter that says they weren't receiving benefits, even if I know they weren't. Um, you have to send notice to the Department of Human Services to find out if they have a claim. If someone has been receiving medical assistance and they're over 55, DHS will assert a claim against the estate. Um, and they will have, for some portion of the claim, a higher priority than some other type of creditors. So you want to know what claim, if any, the Department of Human Services has. Or you want that little letter to stick um, in your files that says, we have no claim. Um, Pennsylvania inheritance tax returns, and more. Um, so the personal representative, so again, that's going to be your executor or your administrator, is responsible for ensuring that all tax returns are filed on behalf of the decedent and the estate. Um, those returns could include the Pennsylvania inheritance tax return. So you may hear that referred to as the Rev 1500. Um, the Pennsylvania inheritance tax return is due nine months from the date of death. If you prepay um, an estimated, if you estimate your tax liability and prepay it within three months of the date of death, you get a 5% discount on whatever you paid. That's not mandatory, but I mean, why pay the state of Pennsylvania any more than um, you have to? Um, you can get an extension on the Pennsylvania inheritance tax return, but just remember that interest will start accruing at nine months and one day. Um, and that runs with the prime rate. Um, federal estate tax return. So that's uh, an, a federal estate tax return. Oh, well, it is a federal estate tax return. So it's a 706 also due within nine months of the date of death. Um, or if you're just filing it to elect portability within five years of the date of death. Most people are not filing federal estate tax returns because currently the federal estate tax exemption is $13.61 million per individual. And then a married couple can effectively shield $27.22 million before having to file or before having any federal estate tax liability. Um, if you your estate's getting closer to those numbers, oftentimes you will be advised to file a return for portability purposes. That's how you'll get to stack your exemption and your spouse's exemption because at the death of the first spouse, 
it's not a taxable event. Everything will just pass to um, the surviving spouse uh, without tax. So in order to kind of utilize both spouses exemption, you do need to file the federal estate tax return and elect portability. Um, those exemption numbers, just kind of a FYI, are supposed to sunset or be reduced to January 1st, 2026. So we're going to revert to 2015 exemption levels if Congress takes no action. Um, so if we revert to 2015 or if we revert to 2015 levels, um, the exemption in 2015 was $5 million. That number will be adjusted for inflation. So I think you'd have probably between six and $7 million in exemption per person, and then 12 to 14, kind of depending on how that um, number plays out. Um, jumping back to the Pennsylvania inheritance tax uh, for a second, there is no exemption in Pennsylvania. So if your net estate is a dollar, Pennsylvania is going to be looking for whatever their share of that is. The only way to really get out of Pennsylvania inheritance tax is give everything that you have away and then live for a year, um, which becomes a little bit more difficult if you've given everything away. Um, other tax returns that may still need to be filed after your death, your final federal and state income tax return. And then if your estate earns any income, so if the estate's earning any income from the date of your death on, um, typically it's, I think the federal file, filing requirement is in excess of $600, you would have to file what's called a fiduciary income tax return. So an estate income tax return, and that's the 1041 or for Pennsylvania, or the PA 41. Um, so who has to file the Pennsylvania inheritance tax and what are these tax rates since you told me that I can't get out of it unless I give everything away and then live for a year. Um, the Pennsylvania inheritance tax is imposed on the transfer of property from the decedents to the beneficiaries. So the tax is basically generated because you're giving your assets to whomever you've chosen or whoever your heirs are at your death. Um, the tax, the, the inheritance tax return has to be filed whenever the decedent is a resident of Pennsylvania with property that's subject to tax. So notice property that's subject to tax, not necessarily tax liability. So if you have property that's subject to tax, even if it's zeroing out, you're still supposed to be filing a Pennsylvania inheritance tax return. Um, or if you're a non-resident um, decedent who has usually like real or tangible personal property here in the state of Pennsylvania. So if you own real estate in the Poconos and you're from New York, you're going to have to file um, a Pennsylvania inheritance tax return in for the, the real estate only, not your whole estate, just for what properties in Pennsylvania. The tax rates, the inheritance tax rates are based on your relationship to the decedent. So it's a 0% um, inheritance tax rate for a spouse and for decedent's children if they're under age 21 and a charity. And that would go the other way too. Um, I think if a minor child passes, it is a 0% tax rate if it's going to parents. 4.5% um, tax rate for decedents adult children, so over 21, um, and then other de lineal descendants, so anyone up and down that lineal line. Um, so parents, uh, parents, yeah, parents, children, grandchildren, they're all four and a half percent. 12 percent tax rate for decedents siblings, and it's it's stopping at siblings, so it's not going to include, like we just did in the four and a half percent, like the rest of the line, like nieces, nephews, um, know that nieces and nephews are going to fall into that 15 percent rate. So the 15% rate is basically for anyone that wasn't covered in the first three. So friends, cousin, niece, nephew, anyone else you can think of. Um, so you filed your inheritance tax return. I will tell you that once you file an inheritance tax return, it does take about five months to get an appraisement back from the Department of Revenue. So you want to have, if you are a personal representative, you want that letter that says there's no additional tax due or and we've accepted your return as filed before you make any distributions to beneficiaries. Um, if you were doing, and we'll talk about this in a second, but if you were making distributions to beneficiaries, you would typically have them sign a receipt and release. And most of those documents will say, hey, like if we found out that there's additional money due, like there's a debt or there is like a valid debt made or claim within a year, um, or there's like tax liability or something like that, we need to get the money back from you to satisfy those claims. 
much harder, much easier said than done, I guess I should say. Um, so oftentimes it's better to make sure that everything is all squared away before making those final distributions to beneficiaries. So you've gotten your appraisement to the extent that there's any other creditors that haven't been paid. You make sure all those creditors get paid. There is a priority of payment for creditors if your estate is insolvent. So you just want to be careful about that. If you pay creditors out of order, um, when you have an insolvent probate estate, um, the personal representative can put themselves like, on the hook to pay other debts. So you don't want to do that. So it's always important to talk to someone and make sure that you know that you are paying people in the proper order and that you're paying valid debts too. Um, the estate can be settled essentially two ways. You can do a formal accounting and a petition for adjudication that gets filed with the orphans court. There is a court hearing and it's a little bit more expensive. Um, typically we try to avoid this as long as everyone's getting along. Um, the preferred way to settle the estate would be through like an informal accounting. So showing here's everything that came in the estate. Here's everything that went out of the estate. This is what I'm left with. Your informal accounting is really only accounting for, again, those probate assets, right? So the assets that are passing outside of your probate estate, so um, joint accounts or beneficiary designated accounts, things like that, they are not necessarily accounted for because they're just going directly to the beneficiaries. Um, and then you have all of the beneficiaries sign off on a receipt and release. So they're saying we're satisfied with the administration. Again, usually that language, like I mentioned, and if we find anything and we need to get some money back from you, we can. Um, if you think that's going to happen any better, I would hold, hold on to the estate for a little bit longer, keep it open. Once everything's been distributed to the beneficiaries, so either after court approval or receipt of all signed receipt and releases, I guess that's another thing I should mention. If you have, for example, if you have five beneficiaries and only three of them will sign the receipt and releases, you can't distribute the funds. Like you need everyone on board, or you have to go the formal accounting petition for adjudication route. Um, and then once all that's complete, you would file a status report with the Register of Wills, and that's pursuant to an Orphan's Court rule. The status report is just simply saying that the estate administration is complete, um, and it's either signed by counsel or the personal representative. If your estate's been open for more than two years, you typically have to provide those status reports giving updates to the court saying, when do we think this is going to be completed? Um, any questions? Um, I have one. The decedent. So the question is, if a decedent has a will, but only has jewelry, art, and furniture, and does not own a home, bank accounts are under a TOD to the children, do they still need to have the will probated? Can the executor just distribute what is written in the will without probate? Um, so if you have, just not on home, so all you have are trans, so TOD is transfer on death, all you have are accounts, so that would be considered a non-probate asset, so the TOD designation is telling you where the assets are going. Um, I don't think you typically need to probate a will for personal property only. Um, I mean, typically you can even transfer a car, which would be considered personal property without going through probate if certain circumstances are met. Um, so yes, I would say that the executor could distribute the personal property um, and the TOD would go to where it's going to go. Though all that stuff is still going to be subject to Pennsylvania inheritance tax, though. So while you may not have to probate, you're still going to have to file a Pennsylvania inheritance tax return. Or if it's a TOD, you might get a form from the Department of Revenue. I think it's a Rev 1543. Um, and that'll, they usually, the Department of Revenue some, sometimes send them. So I, would, I wouldn't bank on it. Um, so you may just want to file the return and it would be a transferee return at that point or like a non-probate return. Yeah. And then you can move forward. So you don't always need probate, but oftentimes you're still dealing with the inheritance type, inheritance uh, tax return aspect of an estate administration. Um, the next question, if a decedent is out of state, the executor needs to go to their home state to file paperwork. Um, so if the question is, I'm going to 
if mom died and mom lives in New Jersey, um, the, yeah, the probate would need to be done in the county that she resided in, in New Jersey. If she also had property in Pennsylvania, once you did the New Jersey probate, you would have to do an ancillary probate here in Pennsylvania to get that real estate. I don't know if that answers your question, Maureen, but I, I think that does. How expensive is probate in Pennsylvania? Um, probate fees, I mean, you can usually see them if you look at the Register of Wills website. I would say it's, it's not as expensive or time consuming as other states like in New York, California, um, Florida, where most of those, uh, most people there are trying to avoid probate at all costs. I would say it's like a t the probate fees are about a tenth of a percent of gross assets. So if you have a million dollar estate, your probate fees are probably about a thousand dollars. Any other questions? Give me another minute. All right. Well, like I said, if you have any other questions, please submit them to our website. Um, GandrewsLaw.com. There is a contact us button. You can submit them that way. Um, it has been a pleasure speaking to all of you and have a great afternoon and a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Thank you.